everyone. Um, first of all, I'd like to say happy birthday to Maud Hart Lovelace. Uh, yeah, I just found out by watching Kelly's video, um, Kelly from Books I'm Not Reading, she said that today is Maud Hart Lovelace's birthday, which I totally forgot. So I think that's pretty cool. She would have been 127 today. So uh, yeah, um, today I'm going to talk about Betsy in spite of herself. So it's the second book in this um, bind up. Um, it was another high school, uh, high school focused book and I loved it. I thought it was so delightful. I, I know that some others have been kind of like, enough with the boy craziness, enough with, you know, talking about, you know, her popularity and, and, and her looks. Um, and to a certain extent, it is um, a very narrow focus. Uh, She's not dealing with a ton of, you know, huge world problems or something. Like if you were to read um, Rilla of Ingleside, this is about a young girl, starts off 14, 15 years old, and she's quite frivolous, And um, but then World War I happens, and she deals with all kinds of drama. It's a really good book. So it's very dramatic, but very co comedic, too. Um, on the other hand, Betsy, she's not living during a world conflict, at least not um, at this point in the story. So um, she just gets to kind of have fun and learn life lessons a little more gently. Um, one that really sticks out to me is... You know, Shakespeare's quote is at the beginning of the book that says, to thine own self be true. And that's why it's called Betsy in spite of herself, because she doesn't want to be herself. She wants to be this mysterious, um, beautiful, exotic woman who draws in all the young men she knows. But she's not that person. She's a fun, happy, um, hyper silly 15 year old girl turned 16 so uh, she learns by the end of the book to be herself which is a very very important lesson especially as you're growing up um, that kind of leads me into her relationship with Phil now there will be spoilers in this video so just so you know Phil is like her new tall dark stranger the previous book her tall dark stranger was Tony she got over that she's just friends with him this book she loves this Phil guy because he's a little bit older, he's good looking, he drives a red car, which was a big deal to have an auto. They call it an auto the whole time. Um, like some of them had hardly even ridden in an auto before, yet, yet to own an auto. That was incredible. Um, the thing about Phil, though, is he just likes this mysterious, exotic version of Betsy. He doesn't like Betsy. And Betsy... Um, she's never, she can never just have fun with him and she's just showing him her, oh, I'm sweet and I'm listening to you talk on and on about your auto and I never try and, you know, say what I'm interested in. And it's good to listen to your, your partner talk about what they love, but to only ever listen to that and to never share who you are too, like, that's a problem. And she learns that. Uh, the other thing about Phil is that he's very jealous and controlling, and that is a red flag right there. So, um, yeah, I'm sure we were all very happy when Betsy came to her senses and ended it with him. Um, another relationship is her and Joe. They're just friends, but everyone can kind of see it coming that, oh, when, when are her and Joe going to get together? And obviously one of the next books is called Betsy and Joe. So we know that they are going to end up together. Um, I just, it's so funny when she like walks into a room, it says that Joe doesn't look at her. He doesn't even glance at her. But then when she comes up to him and, and talks to him, he smiles at her. So it's kind of like, aw, like there's just this sweet little, little kid kind of romance going on between them. Um, yes, another thing that got me a little bit riled up was, um, her English teacher, Betsy's English teacher, Mr. Gaston, is terrible. He's a, I mean, he's a very science-driven person, which is great. He should be teaching science, though, not teaching English. And so whenever she tries to, they, they read Ivanhoe at the beginning of the year, and she writes this essay on Ivanhoe, and she's passionate about it, and she, she tries to come up with exactly with the right words to describe um, that story and to describe how that story made her feel. And she totally fails. Mr. Gaston fails her because he's like, don't show off your poetic abilities to me. I don't care about that. I don't care about your word choices. Just spit back to me what the story is about. And then he gives 
um, Cab and Tony two of the highest marks because they hit the high points of the story. They, they, they just said they outlined the story on, on, in this paper, basically. What he doesn't know is that they didn't even read the book. Betsy told them the high points of the book so they could write the essay the next day. And you're just like, oh, it just made me so mad. But I loved Betsy's response to the situation where he goes, Tony and Cab showed us that showed me that they they read the book. They did just the high points. They didn't go on and on about how beautiful it was. So that's why they get the highest marks. And Betsy, instead of being like, are you kidding me? Like I probably would have been. She went, Oh, that's hilarious. That's so funny that that's what you think, but that's not true at all. So she, of course, keeps all this humor inside of her. She doesn't humiliate the teacher. And I just thought that was so great and mature of her to be the bigger person in that moment. So yeah, um, another little funny detail that I thought was so funny was that when they're playing wedding or whatever, uh, the song they all sing, and this happens at, at all the weddings, the song they sing is Oh Promise Me. So it's that song, Oh Promise Me That Someday You And I. And that song is the song that is sung at Diana Barry's wedding to Fred Wright on the Kevin Sullivan miniseries version of Anne of Green Gables. So I was like, oh, I know that song. That's so funny. I guess back then it must have been the song that would ha would be sung at weddings. So uh, yeah, I thought that was really funny. And another thing that I loved, I'm kind of jumping all over the place here, but another thing that I loved is the football games. They, they always go and watch them play these football games. I'm like, I'm Canadian. Football isn't that huge up here. Like, I don't even know if I've ever been to a football game. So that tells you something. Maybe I've been to one in my life, but like hockey is a much bigger deal. Soccer is a much bigger deal. But football, um, when they, they, they all go, they watch the football games and instead of sitting in the sidelines, back then what they did is they would stand on the sidelines and they would run alongside the game. And I thought that was so cool. Like, it's almost like you're playing the game with them. Like the ball, the ball gets passed and, and you're following the ball and you're running toward the end zone. And it's like that, that just sounded so fun to me. You get a lot more exercise watching no couch potatoes there, but um, I can understand why it's changed, of course. You can't have a mob of people running alongside the players. Um, but yeah. Uh, another thing that I love, I mean, her whole social circle, I love that it's widened. I mean, it's sad that we see less of Tacey, but I love that it's widened. But um, Tacey has a real shining moment in this when uh, Tib invites Betsy to come to, her, to, to Milwaukee to visit her for Christmas. And Tacey is not invited. And... To me, I was like, oh, why couldn't they invite Tacey? And maybe they didn't invite Tacey because they knew her family couldn't afford it, or maybe they could only have one guest. I don't know. But I was like, that is so sad that Tacey didn't get to go to Mil Milwaukee with Betsy. But Tacey, you know, she's, she's disappointed that she can't go, but she is so happy for Betsy. She's just like, Betsy, you're going to have a wonderful time. Tell me all about it. Here's some letters to read on the train. Like, she's just so happy for her. And that totally reminded me of my younger sister, Sarah. She's been on uh, the chat my channel before. She is totally like that. I went to Disneyland with um, my other sister. Actually, I made a video about that. Me and uh, my other sister, Emma, we went to Disneyland with some friends of ours and I was like, oh, what's Sarah going to think? Like, we're going to go to Disneyland without her. Is she going to be okay? I, we talked to her about it. She was just thrilled for us. She's like, go to Disneyland. You'll have so much fun. I'm so happy for you. And not, not jealous at all. So Tacey just really seems like my sister, Sarah, in, in a lot of ways in that way in particular. So yeah. Um, yeah. Another part of this book that I thought was particularly interesting is that when she is in, um, when she's in Milwaukee, uh, which is like a completely German city in that time, basically, which I didn't know, um, she, it's, it's interesting to me that this book came out in 1946, so one year after World War II, and she talks extensively about the German culture and in a very positive way. So I thought that was cool. She even, what really shocked me, was that she even talked about how Tibbs grandfathers. One of them very clearly supports the Kaiser and one does not. So Kaiser Wilhelm II, Kaiser Wilhelm II, he was the one who started World War I. So, uh, World War I, 1914 to 1918. So, eight years later, this Kaiser that the one grandfather is toasting and making a big deal about, Kaiser Wilhelm, he is the one who eight years later is going to start 
World War One, which leads to World War Two. The other grandfather is vehemently against him. He's, he was a 48er, so he came over in 1848 to get away from the Kaiser and all that stuff. So it's just fascinated me that she talked so openly about the, about the Kaiser and, and how they toasted him, how Tibbs' grandfather toasted him, because, um, like, again, you read Rilla of Ingleside, they are so anti-Kaiser. They are, like, burning him in effigy. They're like, he needs to, he needs to burn in hell, basically. Like, they are so anti-Kaiser, which makes sense. It's basically, he was the Hitler of that time in, in some ways. So, um, yeah, I just thought that was brave of her. And also, like, huh, I wonder what Tibbs' family thought of that. Like, if they were if they were like, oh, don't say that, or if it was like, oh yeah, we all toasted the Kaiser, everybody knew that. Um, I mean, I'm sure they all, I'm sure they did. If they weren't 48ers, I'm sure they all did that. But um, yeah, it was just interesting how it kind of went against the grain. So I thought that was cool, how she said what happened, and she didn't shy away from that. Um, because there, it, things are more complicated than just, oh, these people are bad, and these people are good. It's like, these things that these people did were bad, but there's more to them than that. So, yeah, I loved this book, and I am super excited to read the next one. What is the next one? Betsy, oh, Betsy was a junior. Um, I just love these books so much. They're, they're just, they give me such a like warm, cozy feeling. I think I've said that, just like wholesome is the word to describe these books, but not wholesome in a gushy, sickly sweet way, but just wholesome in a, oh, they're just, they're just so good. I can't, can't find the words, but, um, yeah, I am looking forward to reading the next ones. I hope you're all reading good books and enjoying your lives. I will come up with a sign off eventually. So yeah, bye-bye. <laughs>